On the 4th of April 2023, the world's most powerful military alliance became just that little bit larger. On that day, Finland formally became the alliance's 31st member. Although with Sweden's application still in train, it's uncertain how long Finland will hold that particular title. Finland's motivation for joining the alliance should be pretty obvious to everyone. When you're a small nation sharing a long border with a military power that's currently in the business of invading its neighbours, well, there's a certain logic to seeking strength in numbers and sheltering under someone else's nuclear umbrella. Similarly, we've talked before about why this probably constitutes a serious strategic failure for the Russian Federation. Why are countries like the United States or France so eager to sign up to defend a 1300 kilometer border on a country adjacent to the Russian Federation? And how do those kind of commitments serve their strategic interests? Given the discrepancy in power between countries like the United States and, say, Latvia, Lithuania or Estonia, it might be difficult to understand why a collective security organisation like NATO would exist in the first place. And of course, there are those that would argue that it shouldn't, and that Washington would largely be better off leaving small states to their own devices rather than admitting them into NATO, as is the case with Finland or the Baltics, or actively supporting them with aid during a time of war, as is the case in Ukraine. Understanding that behaviour is critical to understanding NATO, US policy and this war. And so today I thought it was worth going back to some Security Theory 101, this time not from the point of view of a smaller nation, but instead from the perspective of a nation like the United States. Because, I would argue, there's a pretty clear case to be made that far from being a drain on American resources, alliances like NATO are critical to the United States' international influence and security position. And as the war in Ukraine is arguably demonstrating, larger powers can need their smaller allies almost as much as they need them. Alright, so what am I going to be talking about today? Well, first I'm going to give a little bit of Collective Security 101. Why do you form alliances in the first place? And specifically, why you would still form them as a great power, many times stronger than the nations you're allying with. I'm going to try and address that question both in general and then also with a specific view to the US stated strategic objectives. Then I'm going to try and roughly quantify some of America's alliances. How powerful is NATO? How powerful are America's Asia-Pacific allies in a military sense? And having finished that process of counting up tanks, ships, guns and planes, gently remind everyone that most competition tends to take place in economic spheres rather than military ones. Humans may be pretty flawed creatures, but we still generally solve most of our differences without bombing each other. And so I'll look at the economic aspects of great power competition and the impact of these alliances. Finally, I'll close out by looking at some of the threats to these alliance structures and also some of the alternatives that have been put forward and how all those factors explain why the war in Ukraine is not just strategically significant for the European powers, for Ukraine or for Russia, but also for more distant Western states like the United States or Canada. I'll caveat it all by saying I'm not advocating for any particular foreign policy position. What I'm trying to do, just as in the Russian Grand Strategy video, is explain the why. What drives America to engage in these sort of alliances and what makes organisations like NATO tick. So to help understand these massive alliance structures, it helps to understand the basic idea of collective security. And I say basic for a reason, this is a very old concept. And that is that generally speaking, a group of humans is more formidable than any given individual. One person probably doesn't have a particularly good chance of taking on a woolly mammoth, an entire tribe does. And when small groups or nations are faced with a more powerful opponent, it can make sense to pull resources together for mutual defence. To both illustrate the point, and because everything is always better with a map, consider the scenario on screen to the right. The fictional nation on the top right that looks kind of like Russia but totally isn't Russia, see I gave it its own flag, in this scenario believes itself to have territorial claims on all the countries in light red. It also has a significant military and a desire to impose its will on those nations. Now, if you're one of those countries in light red, you have a couple of options. On one hand, you could just capitulate, avoid a war entirely, surrender and take whatever conditions you can negotiate. That might save you some blood and treasure, but is probably going to cost you your sovereignty, which is something people throughout history have often been pretty defensive of. You could risk a sort of armed neutrality trying to rely on soft power or your own deterrence to hold off a potential invasion. And that might work, although it also just might not. And if you're unsuccessful in deterring or negotiating away from an invasion, then your probability of victory might be lower than if you had friends backing you up. The final option would be to try and seek some allies, say for example that blob of nations in blue off to the left. You can offer them the deal essentially that you will defend them if they're ever attacked or need help, and in exchange you expect the same. You can express the theory behind that decision in some pretty cold terms. 
On one hand, your chance of being drawn into a war overall might increase because now you're involved in a war not just if you're attacked, but if any of your allies are attacked. If you're Finland and Mexico invades the United States, you may be required to send troops in support, which you wouldn't have been before. But on the other hand, the probability of anyone being attacked goes down significantly as the alliance gets larger. The reason being that as the alliance grows, it becomes more powerful, and as a result, the number of opponents who could feasibly attack it and defeat it decreases. And unless you're Imperial Japan, most nations generally don't like starting wars that it's obvious from the outset that they're going to lose. And so even though an alliance might increase the number of hypothetical ways you could be drawn into a war, it also might decrease the probability of it actually happening. Peace, in essence, through superior firepower. From a theory perspective, an interesting point to make is that as long as a common threat exists, the more nations join an alliance, the more pressure and impetus there's going to be on remaining neutral states to join as well. But this is because the military power of the alliance that you get for joining increases as more countries join up, and the probability of being invaded if you don't join up might also increase. Consider the map on the right there. In that scenario, every country except for Estonia that was in light red has now picked a side. That means, whereas before Totally Not Russia could have chosen any of those countries to be its strategic focus, now if it wants to expand, there's only really one option. Furthermore, it might feel that if it doesn't move quickly, Estonia might join the blue blob and be safe from its ambitions. So the value for joining increases, the risk of not joining also increases. And so the system trends towards an equilibrium where every country that is at genuine risk faces increasing pressure to join one side or another. Or just to build up such a significant domestic military potential that it can feasibly ward off everyone. Otherwise known as how we ended up with a Swedish nuclear weapons program until the mid-1960s. Now alliances can either increase or decrease strategic stability which is a euphemistic way of saying that strategic stability is peace in our time and strategic instability is everything catching on fire and being burnt to a cinder. This is why you might sometimes hear arguments that military alliances can be dangerous. And from a historical and theoretical standpoint, there's a couple of factors that can make them so. The first is where alliances cover offensive action as well as defensive ones, where you promise to back each other up even if one of the alliance members is the country that starts the fight in question. That might encourage countries to start fights that they otherwise wouldn't. For example, if France could attack Switzerland to claim the French-speaking areas and automatically bring all of NATO in, that would be strategically destabilizing. Another destabilizing factor would be where alliances create a scenario where one side that previously didn't think it could win a war now believes it can, and as a result wants to start one. To use a historical example here, if Austria-Hungary hadn't gotten its blank check from Berlin, one has to wonder whether it really would have invaded Serbia, knowing it would spark a conflict with Russia. But it's also possible to build alliance structures that encourage strategic stability. NATO, for example, doesn't allow members to automatically draw the rest of the alliance into an offensive war. The United States could ask other countries to follow it into Iraq in 2003, but it couldn't use Article 5 or the alliance structures to drag them in. Allowing individual members to veto certain actions like accepting new members is another example of a built-in strategic restraint. Finally, the fact that most potential threats like Russia possess nuclear weapons means that even if an alliance like NATO grows to be conventionally superior, there's no practical prospect of successfully invading Russia, for example. And the fact that states like Switzerland feel they can exist entirely surrounded by NATO members without joining themselves points to the fact that it's probably hard enough for NATO members to decide what to serve at their main meetings, let alone to agree on any campaign of global conquest. To illustrate the concept of an alliance creating strategic stability, ask yourself a simple question. If Ukraine had been a member of NATO, do you think that Russia would have invaded it? And if Estonia was not a part of any sort of military alliance, do you think it would still be independent? But that only explains why countries that are under threat might want to join an alliance. It doesn't explain why major powers like the United States would be willing to defend them. One way to help understand this question is to think of security as something that can be produced, exported, and consumed like any other good or service. And once you start thinking about it that way, you'll realize that this is one of the most produced, exported, bought, and sold goods or services in human history. Some nations, particularly those that are small and vulnerable, are going to be security importers, security consumers. Maybe they don't have the population or the wealth to generate the sort of army they would need to keep themselves safe, and so they need to seek protection elsewhere. States with large and capable militaries, by contrast, can be security exporters. 
If you ran a small kingdom at the height of the Roman Empire, one answer to your security issues might be to go to the Empire and ask to be placed under their protection. That might mean having a legion stationed in or near your territories. And having become your security provider and guarantor, Rome was probably going to expect something in return. Because when you think about it, just pledging mutual military aid might not cut it if you're a small and weak power. Because it's probably pretty rare to find a situation when mutual security obligations are of equal value to both parties. Because that would require a degree of military symmetry between both parties. Instead, what you'll often see is security guarantees representing very uneven exchanges. For example, consider the current treaty between the United States and Japan. That treaty provides that an attack either against Japanese or American forces in Japanese territory would be regarded as a threat to both and require a common response. And that has evolved to form the basis of what is more broadly considered to be a military alliance between Japan and the United States. But on the face of it, that doesn't seem to be a particularly fair deal. Japan gets the protection of the US military, arguably still the most powerful in the world. Whereas the US can rely on the help of the Japanese self-defense forces, who I do hope to do a video on at some point and who are formidable. But there is no comparison in scale or capability to their American allies. Japan historically has significantly underspent on defense. And perhaps unsurprisingly, there's massive majority support amongst the Japanese public for the treaty with the USA. It places Japan in the position of being a security consumer and America the security exporter. Another example might be treaties between the US and Canada, where the US essentially provides for Canada the service of kindly keeping everyone hostile away from the North American continent. Because if you want to seize the maple syrup and hockey stadia, you need to go through the US Navy first. And because of the unevenness of this relationship, historically many security exporting countries have taken different models to even up the equation. One historical model would be to annex your neighbours as a way to, quote, protect them, end quote. Why should America expend resources defending Canada when it can simply invade, occupy, and ex Canada, and then use Canada's economic resources to build up further its own military strength so it can repeat that process elsewhere? For an awful lot of human history, this sort of territorial expansionism is pretty much the legitimate done thing. If your neighbour is incapable of defending themselves, well then you make them an offer they can't refuse to come and join the winning team. But the post-World War II international order takes a pretty dim view of military expansionism. That doesn't mean military power can't be used practically as a coercive tool. But it does mean that outright annexations get a pretty dim response from most of the international community, even amongst nominal rivals. Another way to even up the exchange, so to speak, historically has been to create vassal states, protectorates, subordinate countries, whatever you want to call them. There are hundreds of different models throughout history. The common factor here is that the security exporting country takes something valuable in response in order to make that security export worth their while. Depending on the model or point in history you're talking about, that might be monopoly access to markets, it might be an obligation on the vassal state to provide tribute, financial or military, either directly or constructively. Or it might mean the weaker state accepting the subordination of its foreign or perhaps its domestic policy. So for example, if you're in the old Eastern Bloc, the Soviet Union might pledge to defend you if you're ever attacked by the capitalist West. But if you ever get any funny ideas about political reform or embracing even the wrong sort of communism, well then the tanks might roll. Which leads into a final general historical observation about these sort of arrangements. Often the country involved, the junior party, can't simply choose to leave. Once the relationship is established, you will be protected whether you want to be or not. But many Western security arrangements like NATO seem to be missing those sort of compensating factors. The power balance within these relationships obviously isn't symmetrical. America is the primary security exporter, many of the allied nations are consumers. Which means that when America negotiates, it's going to negotiate from a position of power. But that doesn't mean it always gets its way. America has been calling on countries to spend more on their own defense for years. Most still fail to do so. The United States would strongly prefer if allied nations purchased and used American-built hardware supporting American industry. But that hasn't stopped members of the alliance buying from within the EU or increasingly buying from countries like the Republic of Korea or Turkey. Plus, most of these relationships are porous and far from absolute. You can be a member of NATO and still do significant trade in some cases with the Russian Federation. 
Brazil can be a major non-NATO ally of the United States and still be a founding member of BRICS and involved in efforts to find an alternative to the US dollar in international trade. And America can want Sweden to be admitted into NATO, but a country like Hungary still possesses the ability to veto it despite Hungary's comparatively minor contributions to the alliance's overall strength. And so I think it's fair to say that despite the CIA's sometimes colourful history elsewhere in the world, most of America's current security relationships are governed by consent, which at first glance appears to leave America in the position of exporting military protection without gaining something truly valuable in response, like the ability to totally dictate policy. Most great powers don't need to worry about their individual security. They have nuclear weapons, powerful militaries and economies. They're capable of defending their core territory. Instead, what they have to worry about are their interests, their influence, and their ability to shape the world to create the circumstances that allow them to prosper and to remain or become great powers in the first place. To make some very broad generalizations, generally speaking, great powers would struggle to exist and maintain themselves if they focused only on their internal politics. And that's because their success is often shaped by or influenced by external circumstances. The British Empire would have struggled to exist without the structures of empire. The Soviet Union would have struggled to persist and be a great power without the communist bloc. And the US now would probably be much less prosperous, powerful and influential without many of the features that we now regard or commonly refer to as the rules-based international order. Things like freedom of trade and navigation of the seas. And so when you're looking at history or contemporary politics, I find it useful to divide great powers into one of three categories. There are those that are powerful and prosperous because of the existing way of the world, because of the existing conditions. And their motivation is to protect those conditions. The US and many of its allies would fall into this category. It's not that they don't want the world to grow, change or evolve. That may very well be in their strategic interests. But there are certain values or elements of that order that they're going to want to defend. Then there are those states that are currently powerful because they grew powerful under a previous set of rules and systems. Russia's zenith as a great power was during the Soviet era or the era of the Russian Empire when rules were very different. And so this type of power might find it in their strategic interest to try and turn back the clock, so to speak. Rebuilding your old imperial borders, for example, might not be possible if the existing order recognises those territories as belonging to other sovereign independent states. Then there are those states that have grown powerful and influential because of the existing rules of the game, but now having realised and developed that power, would like to continue to reshape the international order to better fit the way they would like things to be. Once upon a time, you could argue the US was actually in this position relative to champions of the existing international order like the United Kingdom. After World War II, the US was a major advocate initially for decolonization and for national self-determination. Over the course of the 20th century, the US dollar replaced the pound as the global reserve currency, and the old imperial trading blocks were broken open for freer trade and investment. The US would even join the Soviet Union in condemning the Franco-British operation during the Suez Crisis in the 1950s. And time after time, in the immediate post-World War II period, the Americans generally got their way on the new rules of the game. Because when you're the economic hegemon and the only one on the block with nuclear weapons, people tend to listen to how you think the play should be run. Plus, it helped that many of the ideas the Americans were advancing around freedom of trade, free navigation, self-determination, and the furtherance of democracy relatively attractive to many nations around the world, even if America itself oscillated between dying in a ditch to defend those values and then sometimes actively undermining them. If you look at US national security strategy today, and I'll link the official document in the description, you can still see an American commitment to defending the international rules-based order coming through. The stated regional goal for the Pacific, for example, is to promote a free and open Indo-Pacific. Freedom of navigation and free access to places like the South China Sea are not just consistent with American values, they're also critical to American economic prosperity. Something like two-thirds of global maritime trade move through the region, and without maritime trade, there is no American economic prosperity. The strategy also talks about the importance of the European alliance, the importance of fostering democracy and shared prosperity around the world, de-escalating and integrating better with the Middle East. And there the strategy openly admits that over the last two decades, quote, we have too often defaulted to military-centric policies underpinned by an unrealistic faith in force and regime change to deliver sustainable outcomes. 
which I think we can all take as a tacit admission that the mission accomplished banner might have been a little bit premature and that America isn't keen for Iraq War 3 any time in the near future. There are more goals there that you're welcome to review, but the strategy also puts forward three strategic approaches to try and realise these goals. Investing in American capabilities and building a military suitable for great power competition should be obvious enough. But the final point is interesting because it calls for building the strongest possible coalitions that defend a world that is free, open, prosperous and secure, and which is inclusive of, quote, all nations that share these objectives, end quote. Which means far from turning away nations that are likely to be security consumers, the US security strategy seems to openly talk about being more inclusive of them, even if they are poor or less powerful. And that finally leads us back to the question of why? From a security perspective, just to start with security for a moment, what does the US get out of these alliance structures? And why would it extend protection to countries considerably weaker than itself? The first point is military bases and unique offerings. This is a simple geographic limitation. If you're going to defend an international rules-based order, you need to be able to act internationally. And until the Marine Corps gets fit enough to reliably swim the Pacific or the Atlantic, having bases in situ is a critical part of doing that. The American military is at its heart an expeditionary one. It goes to where the problems are rather than waiting for them to come to the States. And that ability relies largely on a network of overseas bases. When Americans were wounded in the Middle East, they tended to be evacuated to places like Germany, not flown all the way back to the US. Now that America is currently training Ukrainians on platforms like Bradley, a lot of that training isn't taking place in the US, it's taking place on US facilities in Germany. And in the Asia Pacific, while the US Navy and Air Force are obviously well designed for long range operations, they benefit greatly from having access to ports, airstrips, bases and logistics chains in those friendly countries. The second element is the sort of value that you can generate in certain areas through what you might think of as network effects. This is probably most obvious when it comes to fields like intelligence. Unlike something physical like a tank or a missile where if you supply it to your ally you no longer have a tank or a missile, intelligence is something that can be shared without it disappearing into the void. It can be freely duplicated and distributed. The other interesting element of intelligence is the more of it that you have, the more valuable the rest of it becomes. Reports from one spy or human intelligence resource, for example, might be useful, but they're probably not going to be complete and you're always going to have questions over whether or not they're reliable. But if you can fuse reports from dozens of operatives working for many different handlers, potentially working for different countries with imagery from overhead satellites, with radio intercepts and other sources of intelligence, then you can build a more complete and reliable picture. The US has a major intelligence apparatus, but there are always going to be things that its allies see that it doesn't. And similarly, there are a long list of ideas that can also be freely shared and exchanged. Whether it's new doctrine, new tactics, new technical development, there are plenty of fields in which everyone can metaphorically bring something to the table. And where the values of that idea or that information only expands as the group of allied nations grows too. It's also a reality that there are financial and other limitations on the ability of the US to just simply generate more military power rather than signing up allies to help add to its own. For one thing, the US military is pretty expensive to run because even though it enjoys massive economies of scale, it's operating in a pretty high cost environment. I've got some 2016 numbers on the screen there illustrating just how expensive some US formations can be to maintain. In 2016, a stock standard infantry brigade combat team in the US Army, so about 4,400 personnel, cost about $2.4 billion per year to support. That included an overall manpower footprint of more than 16,000, direct costs of 450 million, indirect costs of 750 million, and overhead costs of 1.2 billion. So building out the force structure to replace the contribution of even a relatively minor ally would almost certainly cost billions of dollars per year. And that's if the United States military could find the manpower. The US doesn't currently have a draft, it's an all volunteer force, so people have to want to sign up. Which means even if the US government wanted to replace some of its allied forces with more military punch of its own, it's limited by the recruiting pipeline. And America already struggles to hit its recruiting goals. I believe the Army missed its goal by about 15,000 last financial year. 
So until robots become a viable replacement for combat troops, the US only has a couple of options if it wants to expand its force structure. It can lower its standards to let more people in at a cost of force quality. It can increase the compensation paid to try and attract more people into the military, which obviously increases costs. Or it can give up its plans and reduce the scale of the planned force. And in a country where many people have other economic opportunities, trying to maintain a force that is already almost as large as the Indian military, can be quite a task. But the most important element to remember here is that when you export security, unlike many other goods or services, it isn't necessarily used up. If I offer to protect, say, Poland from Russia as the United States, what I really need is enough military force to discourage Russia from invading Poland in Europe. If I then decide I want to also extend that protection to the countries in the Baltics, that doesn't necessarily mean I now need more military force. I already had enough troops and force in place to be able to deter Russia. All I'm doing is expanding the number of countries that I'm protecting with that insurance policy. Plus now I can also factor the Polish military into my deterrence plan. And when I do the calculus to determine whether I'm also capable of defending Finland against Russia, well, I can factor in both Poland and the Baltics. And this is part of the key of how you turn an apparently bad deal into a good one. With each alliance signed in a region, provided those alliances are guarantees against the same basic set of threats, each deal is a win-win. The nation joining obviously wins more because it now receives a massive security guarantee. But the US and the existing ally partners receive something too, the support of the joining nation. Now I know there are schools of people out there who don't believe in such things as win-win deals, but let me put it this way. If I make a deal with someone wherein they make 10 bucks and I make one, you might think I'm a chump. But if I can repeat that same deal with 10,000 different people, suddenly I'm the richest one in the room. And when you start assessing the entire scope of what most people would think of as the Western military alliances, that becomes obvious pretty quickly. Because NATO, to put it in scientific terms, is bloody huge. Founded in 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is probably the most powerful military alliance to have ever existed. Over the years, the 12 founding members have been joined by many other countries. Finland's recent accession makes it number 31. Now, it's worth noting that being founded in 1949, while it was some decades ago, doesn't exactly make NATO the oldest active military alliance in the world. To my understanding, that distinction goes to the Anglo-Portuguese alliance established by treaty in 1386. It's a treaty that, despite its immense age, is still recognised as remaining in force and leads to interesting historical trivia. Like the fact that during the Falklands War in 1982, Portugal offered up basing rights to the UK to assist in retaking the islands, in part because of a marriage which took place in 1386. Now, we all know that marriage is a major decision, it can shape our lives. But I reckon it's a pretty good effort to still have your marriage shaping global affairs six centuries later. Returning to NATO then, the United States is clearly the heavy hitter of the alliance, so to speak. US officers have often played key roles in the alliance's command structure. And as the most significant military contributed to the alliance, the Americans have often set the agenda as first among equals on things like equipment standardization. In any given bilateral relationship within the alliance, the US usually has the stronger negotiating hand. But that doesn't mean the rest of the alliance is toothless. By the alliance's own estimates in 2022, the other NATO allies besides the United States will add about 381 billion US dollars equivalent in military spending. And partly prompted by the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, many European alliance members have announced grand plans to significantly increase their budgets in coming years. Digging further into those numbers, the major contributors are exactly who you'd expect, the largest European economies, the United Kingdom, Germany, France and Italy. But if you've been watching my videos for a while now, you'll know that expenditure doesn't tell the whole story, far from it. Purchasing power parity is a thing, otherwise the Indian and Chinese militaries would not be the significant forces they are. And the Russian military probably would have collapsed before it even got so far as the start line. And failing to account for PPP, among other things, creates some weird anomalies when you look at the data, like Turkish defence expenditure looking like it is decreasing. Not because the Turkish government has cut defence spending, but simply because the lira has depreciated so damn much against the US dollar over the past several years. 
And so to assess what the NATO allies bring to the table, it's useful to look at things like manpower figures and platforms as well as just raw expenditure. And in terms of manpower figures, while it's a little bit messy in terms of determining what should and shouldn't count as a reservist in different countries' force structures, the numbers are still pretty clear. Taken together, the non-US NATO forces have a considerably larger amount of active and reserve manpower than the Americans do. Collectively, the non-US allies have almost 2 million personnel, which makes them collectively larger than the Indian military and almost on par with the PLA. A lot of the heavy lifting here, as as you would expect, done by a small number of states that still, for the most part, maintain compulsory military service. Finland's accession, for example, added more than 200,000 reservists to that particular graph. Now, obviously, there are caveats here. Not all of that manpower would be available in the case of any given contingency, and quality is inconsistent. But neither would all of the US military be available to respond to a contingency in Europe, and the war in Ukraine has showed that sometimes manning levels and mass have a value all of their own. And the fact that a Polish special forces operator might be paid significantly less than their American counterparts doesn't take away from the fact that they might be professional, extremely capable troops. There's some similar points to be made around equipment figures, although again, caveats around what counts, what shouldn't count, what's active, what's not active, and what quality is there in place. All of those remain relevant, but the numbers are there. In terms of ground combat systems, the NATO allies have considerably more artillery tubes and considerably more main battle tanks than the Americans do, with that latter example in large part being thanks to the Turks and the Greeks pointing Europe's largest tank fleets directly at each other. Within those broader equipment figures, there are some interesting asides. The Montenegrin army of 1,500 people, for example, is estimated to have something like 30 tube and rocket artillery systems, as well as 100 mortars. At which point I have to assume every single one of them is an artilleryman, or they hand out mortars as enlistment bonuses or something. At sea as well, the numbers are not insignificant. For sea lane control, you don't just need super carriers and Aegis cruisers, sometimes you just need hulls in the water. And the NATO allies also bring something like 148 approximately principal surface combatants, so things like destroyers, frigates, cruisers, to the table. Essentially what I'm saying is that while each of these nations individually brings a lot less to the table than the US when they're brought into the alliance structure, once you start adding them up, the numbers quickly become significant. And so when people like Scott Ritter say that NATO has no way to defend itself against Russia in a conventional war, I can only look at these figures and ask, how? How is a force that is still struggling at Avdivka 13 months after the beginning of their full-scale invasion meant to chew through that much manpower and that much metal? On the other side of the world, in another area of keen US strategic interest, the Asia-Pacific, there's no direct NATO analogue. Instead, the US maintains a number of bilateral treaties and agreements with various powers in the region. Now, none of these agreements are identical, they all have different terms, but for the ease of illustration, I'll bundle many of them together here. If you bundle together the Republic of Korea, Japan, Australia, the Philippines, and the forces on the island of Taiwan, the result is the graph you see on the right there, with approximately 1.2 million active and nearly 5 million reserve personnel. And I'm just saying, I really don't want to know what sort of tactics US military recruiters would have to deploy in order to build out the Army Reserve and National Guard to an equivalent 5 million personnel figure. And I think those figures crystallise and gain more meaning when you take them out of the abstract and put them in the context of potential military scenarios. Because military power isn't actually an abstract, it doesn't exist on some massive leaderboard where you can put all countries up against each other and broadly rank a leader table 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The ability of a nation to exercise military power only exists within the context of an actual scenario, and reality has a way of imposing limits on the practical ability of countries to bring all of their force to bear. The United States is not physically connected to North Korea, for example, nor is it likely to round up all of the uniformed bureaucrats in the Pentagon, give them rifles, and march them off to the trenches in order to ward off the DPRK. Whereas if the worst came to worst, that is probably something the South Koreans would do. So to crystallise the capabilities of America's alliance structures, I thought I'd look at two quick scenarios, a European escalation and a Korean crisis. So to start with, let's build a quick European hypothetical. Totally not Russia, took Kyiv in three days, pacified the state of Ukraine, 
and has now decided to settle its business with the Baltic states and Poland. Total victory probably isn't on the cards, the idea probably being to take as much territory as possible and then threaten some sort of nuclear escalation in order to try and bring the conflict to a frozen semi-conclusion. The job of NATO's conventional forces is to repel this offensive, reclaim any taken territory, and bring sufficient deterrent force to bear as to discourage a nuclear escalation. In this scenario, American troops and aircraft have a significant role to play, no doubt. Figures vary over time, but at the moment there are approximately 100,000 US personnel in Europe, and many of those belong to relatively high capability, high readiness formations. But those troops would be outnumbered just by the personnel of those nations that sit on the border with not Russia, Poland, Finland, and the Baltic states. In addition, the NATO response force would presumably be involved. That currently numbers approximately 40,000, with plans to increase it to several hundred thousand high readiness personnel. That, coupled with the air forces of every NATO POW within range of the combat theatre, would presumably be the force that took the initial brunt of the offensive. While follow-on and reinforcing units would presumably flow both from the continental United States, but also from the other NATO nations that have a lot less distance to cover. Transporting personnel and equipment from France or Germany to Poland is going to be a lot more practical than moving something from the US West Coast to the field of battle. And so while the US is going to bring some critical capabilities, nuclear deterrence, long-range strike, high-capability combat units, munition supply, you name it, they're bringing it to this fight. A lot of the mass and a lot of the combat power in this scenario that is going to drive a victory or enable a defeat is going to come from the European NATO powers, as is a lot of the logistic backbone. Equipment material is going to be moved on European railways. Fuel and food is going to be provided by European storages and European infrastructure. And of course, as new forces arrive, form, concentrate and deploy, they're going to be using European bases and European transport networks. So when you talk about the US goals of deterring aggression in Europe, well, a lot of that deterrence work is being done by the European NATO allies. Because while yes, there are issues with ammunition storages or force readiness, a huge amount of the infrastructure and the available combat forces are provided by those powers. The situation isn't hugely different if we construct a scenario on the other side of the world. Now, personally, I have doubts over North Korea's logistical ability to sustain high-intensity operations for a protracted period of time. But North Korean logistics and storages are so opaque that for the purpose of this scenario, let's assume that they can do it. Having stockpiled tens or hundreds of millions of shells, fuel, food, and all the supplies they need, the North Koreans decide to make a go of it and attack South Korea, or perhaps there's some flashpoint incident that escalates out of control and the war goes hot. American policy would call for the defense of South Korea as a matter of strategic importance. And no doubt, America would start to scramble resources to the theater. But in the early stages, who would do the actual fighting? Because while America has some high quality forces in Korea, there's only about 25,000 of them, outnumbered more than 20 times over just by their active duty South Korean compatriots. In the event of war, you'd expect the ROK to begin calling up its reservists and forming additional divisions as well. And so in those initial days when the fighting is likely to be at its most intense because North Korea won't have depleted any of its reserves of equipment or logistical capacity, it will probably be the South Koreans doing the vast majority of that initial fighting. Because as with the other examples given, while the active duty South Korean military is smaller and less powerful than its US equivalent, it's almost all based in Korea, where the fight in this scenario is, whereas the US military is spread around the world. Taken collectively, a small group of Asia-Pacific allies have almost as many main battle tanks as the US military in active service. And in terms of just artillery tubes, the Republic of Korea actually has more in service than the American military, in part because they expect to fight an artillery-centric war against an artillery-centric North Korean military. With conscription keeping personnel costs down and a focus on the exact sort of equipment they need to fight this hypothetical scenario, the ROK is able to bring a lot more to the table in this scenario than its simple spending figures would suggest. And so it does a lot of heavy lifting, both in preserving the security and sovereignty of the Republic of Korea, but also indirectly in advancing the strategic objectives of the United States which involves discouraging any attempts by countries in the Asia-Pacific to redraw boundaries by force. Now make no mistake, that doesn't mean the US alliance doesn't provide critical protection to various allied states in the Asia-Pacific. 
For the allied countries in the Asia-Pacific, the Americans are the providers of critical nuclear deterrence. Because all the conventional capability in the world doesn't protect you from the other person threatening to nuke your capital city. America also provides the vast majority of long-range precision strike capabilities, the most formidable their superiority assets, a variety of enablers, and all the capability represented by the United States Navy and by the United States Marine Corps. But my core point is that while this is not an exhaustive list of scenarios, we haven't looked at African or Middle Eastern scenarios, for example, but in many scenarios you can draw up in places like Europe or the Asia-Pacific, the United States is hardly fighting alone. Instead, it's fighting alongside local allied forces that in many cases and in many respects may vastly outnumber the American complement. And in the absence of those allied forces, the ability of the Americans to achieve their goals in these respective regions would be significantly undermined. Now, all of that analysis was focused on hot war scenarios. It was about counting personnel, platforms, etc. But those aren't the only benefits that nations derive from joining military alliances. And that includes the United States. I could, for example, do an entire video on the impact of these alliance systems on the Western defense industrial base. But the summary is that even though we commonly think of a product as being produced by a particular country, say, for example, a new generation of naval frigates that might be being built in France, that ship is likely to include subsystems produced across the European Union and other NATO allies. It may include American-built missiles, maybe Italian sensors or gun systems. It may have motors that were produced originally in Germany. The list goes on. These supply chain decisions aren't just about politics. They're also about getting the best possible capabilities within the offered price. And even when you're talking about something as large and well-funded as the American defense industrial base, there are still significant benefits from being able to access providers and suppliers in, say, Europe or allied Asian states. Technology exchange can still have genuine value, and everyone can realize reduced costs by selling at scale across different alliance members. So if these alliance structures were ever to be dismantled, you would essentially have a choice. You can either choose to build equipment to a lower standard of capability, or you can accept increased costs. No one can efficiently do it all, not even the United States. You also provide some room for all members of the alliance, including the United States, to somewhat depress their defense expenditure. While the Americans expect to do a lot of heavy lifting in most military scenarios, they can also assume the involvement of their allies, and the allies can assume the involvement of the US in turn. Allies are instead allowed to specialize, focus on the things that they're good at, and build forces that complement each other. And the Americans don't have to focus on trying to maintain a ground combat force of 300,000 active duty troops in South Korea. Most of that job can be done by the Koreans. Instead, the US military has to focus on building up the right capabilities to create a decisive impact and contribution in that conflict should it ever go hot. Break up those alliance structures and suddenly everyone is paying a lot more to achieve the same results. And perhaps the final military aspect to talk about is the impact on non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. Because as much as people discussing who would win scenarios on the internet love to sometimes forget that nuclear weapons exist, they very much do and you do not want to get hit by one. Now the United States has an interest in keeping as few nations nuclear capable as possible. That's one of the main goals of the non-proliferation regime. The basic logic being that the world is a safer place, the chance of accidents is lower if there are fewer nuclear warheads out there controlled by a smaller number of actors. And it's part of the reason why the US was so active in convincing Ukraine to hand over its nuclear weapons and delivery systems. And under the present structure, many American allies are happy to go along with this. They don't have to spend money on their own nuclear deterrent, they happily sit under the US nuclear umbrella. Although the, uh, the game theory value of that is a topic for another video. So these countries realize a financial saving and America achieves its non-proliferation goals. Because in the absence of these sort of alliances, you can bet that many current US allies would seriously look at acquiring their own nuclear weapons. Japan and South Korea would probably be the two most obvious candidates. Both, after all, are threatened by an already nuclear-armed North Korea. Both have a significant technology base and the funds to make it happen. So by providing those two states with security guarantees, the US gains not just valuable allies, but also discourages them from feeling like they have to acquire nuclear weapons. But again, all of those elements have a military flavor to them. And while that's a legitimate thing to focus on, it doesn't make up the entire story. 
Because security exports don't just build military capability and reinforce deterrence, they also build relationships and align interests. And when countries become aligned and become used to acting in concert with one another, then sometimes that doesn't just have impacts on military affairs, sometimes it crosses over into economics as well. Because if a country is your primary security provider and it asks you for a favour on an economic matter, then you're far more likely to say yes than if there was no relationship to speak of. And that's really important because a lot of international competition and confrontation doesn't actually result in a kinetic exchange. When the EU and the US are fighting over renegotiated trade deals, the Americans don't escalate the matter by bombing Berlin. The primary Western response to a suspected Iranian nuclear weapons program has been sanctions and economic pressure, not an outright invasion. And in order to make sanctions work, in order to make them actually effective, they need to have some serious economic weight behind them. Otherwise, they're either not going to hurt, or they're going to hurt the person imposing the sanctions as much or more than the one on the receiving end. And if you're trying to measure economic muscle through the admittedly very imperfect measure of nominal GDP, then you'll see that while still massive, the US isn't the unchallenged economic juggernaut that it was in, say, for example, the 1950s when a lot of Europe was still levelled. The graph on the left shows that if you use IMF nominal USD GDP estimates from 2022, then if you add the Chinese and Russian economies together, it's about $20 trillion compared to $25 trillion for the USA, hardly a decisive advantage. Look at the graph on the right, though, and you can see the difference that a number of allies makes. Adding the non-US members of NATO, so that includes Canada and the United Kingdom as well as the Europeans, basically adds another US all over again to the total economic package. Whereas the APAC economies that we were talking about before, countries like South Korea and Japan, are collectively about half the size of the Chinese economy. Now you can obviously add a lot more countries to this chart, there's a variety of non-aligned countries, countries that you could argue are aligned on either side, and that would just make the whole situation messy. The point is that in raw economic terms, the US is no longer the sole centre of the economic universe. But if you consider it alongside its allied states, well then suddenly their collective economic power is something that can't be ignored. By himself, someone like Elon Musk is a headline on Twitter. But if the hundred richest people on the planet started working together, well then you'd have a Call of Duty storyline in the making. When it comes to making financial sanctions hurt, for example, this sort of scale really matters. If you're sanctioned, for example, by 20% of the global producers of a particular good or service, the effect of that's probably going to range from mild inconvenience to not noticeable at all. But if you're sanctioned by 90% of producers, that might be crippling. When you're talking about financial sanctions, the thing that's being weaponized is currencies, banks, and systems of exchange. When assets are being frozen, it's a weaponization of currency and of these financial systems. Now, the US dollar is still the world's primary reserve currency. If you look at the foreign exchange reserves that governments and banks around the world hold for a rainy day, almost 60% of it is made up of US dollars. If sanctions are applied, that's enough to make an impact, but it's hardly crippling in and of itself. I can diversify my holdings into other currencies and continue doing business. But an additional 20% of Forex reserves are in euros, 6% are in yen, 5% are in pounds, 2.5% are in Canadian dollars, 2% are in Australian dollars, you get the picture. Sanctions applied just on US dollar holdings are going to hurt. Sanctions that target everything else in that rainbow of currencies are going to really hurt. But only if the American government or whatever other country is trying to initiate the sanctions can convince and negotiate with the others to bring them along. The situation is pretty similar when you look at the currencies that make up the balance of international trade. Again, this could be a video of its own, but in essence, normally when I'm trading on an international market, if I want to buy something from someone else, then if I'm a resident of most countries in the world, I'm probably not settling those large transactions with my own domestic currency. Most countries don't want my rubles, they want US dollars or euro or something similar. So if I want to buy, if I want to interact on the international market, I have to get some other deal or I have to get my hands on some of those currencies. And that might leave me vulnerable to sanctions by the countries that control said currencies. The graph on the right there shows the relative importance of various currencies in international settlement as of April 2022. If you're having trouble reading the graph, then just note that the total should add up to 200% because every transaction has two sides. If I am trading US dollars for euros, for example, that is a USD euro transaction. 
And what you can see is that at that time, 88.5% of those transactions had the US dollar as one of the involved currencies. That's significant if you want to impact someone's ability to trade on international markets. But if you add some other currencies, you can really amp up the pressure. The euro, for example, accounted for more than 30%. Currencies like the yen, the won, and the Australian dollar, that sort of APAC bundle added up to 27.8%. Non-US, non-euro countries, that's 24.4%, with the largest being the British pound. And the combination of the Hong Kong dollar and the Chinese yuan are down there at 9.6%. Those figures are built up in aggregate. The Swedish krona accounts for 2.2%, the Polish loti 0.7%, it all adds up. And it adds up to a scenario where you can't exactly stop the Russian government, for example, trading on international markets. But you can make it expensive, slow, difficult, risky, inconvenient, and target a variety of their foreign exchange assets. That's one reason why I'd suggest that a lot of nations appear to have reacted with significant alarm to the scale of the financial sanctions levied against Russia. Which means I have to make a quick aside into all the news that's now coming out about these sanctions causing the downfall of the US dollar. The story being that for reasons of insert narrative here, the US dollar is now about to be dethroned, as countries no longer want to leave themselves vulnerable to sanctions on the USD or the Euro. Now I had a finance major on one of my degrees, I'd love to make a video about this someday, but for now, here's the spark notes. The end of the US dollar has been forecast, predicted, and called many, many times. That Economist article on the right there, that's from 2004. Although funnily enough, in that era, one of the primary threats to the dollar was meant to be, well, the euro. The recent news that China and Brazil would begin settling some of their trade in their local currencies rather in US dollars and euros seemed very significant. And it may well be, but something similar was announced in both 2009 and 2013. So I'd only count these things as done deals once they actually start playing out in reality, not just in announcements. And then there were the recent headlines that OPEC would sever the link between the dollar and the pricing of oil. That these countries were sick of their profits being eaten away by inflation in the Western markets. And that it was time to stop quoting oil in US dollars. The problem is that the recent article that featured those headlines and quotes is from 1975, which I'll admit is a pretty generous interpretation of recent. My point is that the dominance of the US dollar, the euro, and allied countries is of course under threat. There are a lot of factors putting special pressure on it right now. But efforts to undermine the dominance of the dollar are also nothing new. And yet, many decades on, here it still stands. And so for the purpose of this video, we take the world as it is. And in that world, the combined power of currencies like the US dollar, the yen, the won, the pound, the euro, etc. is significant. If you want an illustration of this power in action, look no further than the freezing of Russian assets in the early parts of 2022. The Russians reported that about half of their foreign exchange assets were frozen overseas, which if true either represents a monumental stuff up worthy of a trip through a window, or proof that Putin in the inner circle did not tell the Russian central bank before they did something, you know, that might disrupt international financial markets like invading Ukraine. Now to be clear, it's still very much unclear where all of these frozen assets are. But if we go by figures that were accurate in, I believe, 2021, it illustrates the point. US sanctions alone would have hurt with about 9% of Russian foreign exchange reserves in the US. But 16% were in France, 13% in Japan, 12% in Germany, and 6% in the United Kingdom. In that context, the difference between 9% and 50% could impact how long Russian military expenditure during the war in Ukraine is sustainable by years. And if you want to hunt oligarch assets, well, you have to hunt them where they are. Most oligarchs were smart enough not to set their mansions up in Boston or DC. And if you tell them that they can't travel to the United States, most of them probably aren't going to be too shook up about it. I mean, given LA traffic, personally, I would give it a pass too. But if you start taking away their London mansions or telling them they can't dock their super yachts in the south of France or in Italy, well, now you're really hurting them. I'm not saying you're likely to impoverish any of these people. But if you're talking about assets that can be frozen or potentially seized, well, then the more countries that you can include in the process, the more assets you're likely to vacuum up. And then finally, there's the matter of resources and security. 
Because raw economic power, things like GDP, that's really just an abstract. GDP doesn't just exist. It's reliant on a continual flow of inputs and outputs, labor, raw materials, etc. The globalization of supply chains for those materials has been one of the great drivers of global economic growth. It's helped keep inflation down. It's elevated hundreds of millions or billions of people out of poverty. But the ability to disrupt and control those flows is a tool of coercion and deterrence. It has a role in security policy. Alliances are a way to help create that security. If you are the primary security provider to a country, it's not likely to cut you off from the supply of critical inputs. Whereas if a critical mass of suppliers of a resource get together and form an alliance, well, they can exercise considerable power. OPEC is perhaps the most famous example of this. This is the long-lived organization of petroleum exporting countries. Basically, an alliance of oil producing states that get together to coordinate increases and decreases of production levels. A recent announcement by the OPEC nations that they would be cutting production, for example, provided a considerable uptick in the oil price something which strained relations between the Saudis and the Americans. But at the same time, there's not much the rest of the world can do about it. Everyone still wants oil, so if there is less of it on the market, the price is going to go up. I mean, really, the nightmare scenario would be the Americans and Canadians joining OPEC+. Because nothing says dystopian ending like DC, Moscow, Riyadh and Tehran getting together to give us all $300 a barrel crude. Another example of this would be in the semiconductor sector. America has been very open about its attempts to restrict the exports of key technologies for the manufacturing of advanced semiconductors to the People's Republic of China. But those efforts wouldn't really have meant much if other producers of critical equipment and technology didn't join in as well. In this case, that meant places like the Netherlands and Japan. Another example would be shipping sensitive military goods to Russia. Banning American companies from sending advanced thermal gunnery sites to the Russians wouldn't have made much difference. If, for example, French companies could just pick up the slack. Exercising power in this way requires a critical mass, and a critical mass usually requires building a coalition. In the global market, even basic critical commodities are sometimes vulnerable to this kind of concentration, with relatively few actors accounting for a majority of exports or imports. Rare earths have a constrained number of suppliers. Copper, constrained number of suppliers. 48% of lithium exports come from Australia, Canada, or Portugal, a further 30% from Chile. And the more countries that you can count amongst your friends and allies, whether that friendship is based on you as a security exporter or some other source, the more likely you are to have a critical mass of some resource or another, and the less likely you are to be vulnerable to a critical shortage of some resource or another. Heck, even really basic things like iron ore can become very concentrated. You know, iron ore, which you need to make things like steel, which is kind of basal to a lot of construction and economic activity. Good luck building a skyscraper out of wood. In 2021, about 70% of all global iron ore exports went to the People's Republic of China. 54% of all exports came from Australia, 9% from a combination of Ukraine, Sweden, and Canada, and Brazil accounted for about 23% with a slightly different data set. At those sort of concentrations, alternative sourcing becomes really, really difficult because there simply isn't enough in the way of alternative sources involved. And so you all know what that means. It means those five nations should obviously get together and form the OPEC of iron ore exports, BUSCA, Brazil, Ukraine, Sweden, Canada, and Australia. The tagline would be obvious, pay up or go back to the Bronze Age. I am 100% joking, please do not take me out of context, but hopefully I have made the point. Global supply chains are making us all richer, but they also make us all vulnerable. Building a network of allies is how you guarantee yourself against getting cut off from critical inputs, or how you can deter others from trying to do so in the first place. And when you're talking about the ways in which you can build friendships and alliances as a great power, well, it's about soft power, influence, and also what you bring to the table, how vital your strategic contribution is. And being a primary security provider, well, that's a pretty significant contribution. And when Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, all of that theory was suddenly about to be tested. That accumulation of military power, economic heft, friendships, and alliances was about to face a fairly direct challenge. Because while Ukraine was neither a member of NATO nor a bilateral American ally, 
The Russians have been very clear and very open about the fact they regard the invasion as an opportunity to strike a blow against an American-led world order. Just recently, Lavrov has talked about the unacceptability of US leadership and the importance of any peace agreement in Ukraine being built on the principles of a new world order. And in terms of how the alliance system was able to respond to this particular challenge, while there were definitely some bumps in the road, in general, I would observe the system broadly performed as expected. The nations of Central and Eastern Europe, with a particular honourable mention to the United Kingdom, essentially served as first responders. The Poles and the Czechs were among the first to push heavy weapons into Ukraine. And it is bases and infrastructure in countries like Latvia, Poland, Czechia and Slovakia that underpin the efforts to aid Ukraine. America leveraged those things that it's good at, becoming the largest provider of critical weapons systems to Ukraine. But it left other mammoth tasks like accommodating millions upon millions of Ukrainian refugees to its European allies. Even some partnerships in the Asia-Pacific with countries like Australia, Japan or South Korea were activated. And some of the aid that reached Ukraine came from half a world away. America did not get to dictate every aspect of the Allied response. There were some countries that wanted to move faster and harder, and some did so, while others, even now, continue to lag behind. But overall, they all broadly moved in the same direction. And it's hard to imagine how the American goal of supporting and stabilising Ukrainian resistance could have been accomplished without that Allied contribution. Sanctions, likewise, were heavily debated and didn't end up looking exactly like Washington wanted. But they were also far more severe than many pre-war analysts had expected and were far more effective as multilateral actions than they would have been if Washington had acted alone. If the Russians had hoped that NATO would splinter under the pressure, they would be steadily disabused of that notion, one weapons shipment at a time. Following the invasion, popular support for NATO is near record highs. There isn't a single one of the alliance's 31 members where a majority of residents, if given the chance, would vote to leave the alliance. In countries like Albania or Poland, the Leave vote is within the margin of error of being zero, while in Estonia the Leave vote is considerably smaller than the share of population that are Russian language speaking. And perhaps more importantly for the US, the share of Europeans who regard a close relationship between North America and Europe as essential remains overwhelming. Separating the Europeans from the United States would be to the great advantage of powers like Russia. But the vast majority of NATO citizens regard a friendship with the United States as critical to their nation's security. And nothing increases your appreciation of security like a war breaking out next door. And so far from breaking up these coalition structures, it appears so far the Russian invasion of Ukraine has reinforced them. Which is a problem for Russian strategists because for as long as NATO hangs together, the sheer power of the alliance makes any direct confrontation, shall we say, inadvisable with most likely outcomes in such a scenario, including the Russian military being comprehensively demolished. Now, of course, that doesn't mean those bonds are unbreakable, nor does that mean this is always the way it's going to be, or that America's strategic position is in any way unassailable. One threat might simply come from soft power competition. On one hand, one of the greatest strengths of the US alliance structure is also one of its greater vulnerabilities, that is, involvement is voluntary. If the American reputation suffers too much or the economic pressures are too great, well, the alliance structure might lose members, it might fragment. And in any theoretical alliance, the fewer members that exist, the fewer network benefits can be generated, and all else being equal, the fewer reasons there are going to be for others to stick around. Around the world, in most countries, global opinions of America compared to its major potential competitors are still quite high. But there's no reason to say that couldn't change. You could see greater soft power efforts by other powers. Or if America starts utilising its position in ways that most countries don't agree with, well, then it can damage its own reputation. Now, I want to be very clear, nations should be able to decide their own policy. And history has shown America is probably strong enough to selectively ignore some of the rules that it claims to support. But doing so is always going to have diplomatic consequences. And losing friends can have security and economic implications. Another possibility in America, as in almost any country, is that they just decide to walk away from it all of their own accord. America, like many countries, has a strong history of isolationist thinking, and with American geography being what it is, separated from so much of the rest of the world, in a strict security sense, they have that privilege. The Canadians and the Mexicans aren't exactly going to invade the United States. And while its foreign trade and influence would obviously be vulnerable, the homeland itself would in any scenario probably be secure. 
And again, if you look at the historical examples, you can see the core sentiment that is almost universal across different states. You can always point to issues within the country, issues here at home. And the question can always be asked, why are we sending resources overseas? Why are we worried about foreign matters when there are very real social or economic issues at home that need to be dealt with? The costs of things like foreign aid and foreign engagement are always going to be really obvious. They show up as budget lines. Every set of aid to Ukraine gets a new press announcement. The benefits of those actions, meanwhile, are harder to quantify and demonstrate. They're not as real and as concrete, even if they are significant. In that respect, it's kind of like a nuclear deterrent. It's very obvious what the costs involved are. What's almost impossible to assess is how many wars the possession of those weapons may have prevented. And in a globalised economy where no country is an island, where no nation can truly prosper without full engagement with global markets and diplomacy, it's likely that engagement brings considerable value to counterbalance the expenditure on it. But for the moment, I'm not sure it's worth dwelling on this particular scenario. As I've said before on this channel, I try to take the world as it is. And at the moment, a majority of Americans still strongly support the nation's engagement abroad. Americans trust NATO considerably more than they trust their own political leaders, with the most recent results being 58% trust versus 12% distrust. Now, I don't know whether that reflects well on NATO or just poorly on American politics, but it does seem to suggest that Americans are unlikely to simply up and abandon their alliances and cede the world stage to other powers anytime soon. At the other end of the spectrum, there's the possibility that the US will choose to double down on this alliance-based system and its role as a security exporter. US security strategy talks about broadening the tent and building the widest possible coalition. That means engagement not just with traditional allies in Western Europe or Asia. It would mean genuine support and engagement in Africa, South America, and with major rising powers like India. There would be a cost to that sort of engagement, not just monetarily, but also in terms of US autonomy. Genuine partnerships require taking genuine notice of the concerns and interests of the other allied parties. Different countries have different expectations of how a country like the US will behave as a leading international power. And just like America's existing major allies, they're going to want to have their voices heard. But at the same time, the possible benefits are also obvious. A broader coalition means more economic opportunity and reduced economic vulnerability. It means more opportunities to generate network effects and efficiencies. And perhaps most significantly, it increases buy-in and support for the existing rules of the game the rules-based international order that has underpinned American prosperity now for decades. In conclusion, security can be thought of as something that can be imported or exported. US strategy is in part based on the idea of the US operating as a security exporter. The US military offers protection to countries around the world and in so doing helps to build alliances and coalitions. In turn, those alliances and coalitions underpin US international grand strategy. Because combined, those partners represent a massive concentration of political, economic, and military power. In the absences of those alliances or coalitions, the Americans' ability to defend their interests or values abroad would be significantly diminished. And there are certainly signs that certain aspects of that influence may be challenged in the coming years. And the way that America, NATO, and its various other allies have responded to the war in Ukraine demonstrate that theory can be translated into practice. Time will tell whether these coalitions ultimately begin to atrophy or continue to grow and expand. But for the moment, at least, I would argue that far from breaking apart this coalition system, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022 has endowed it with a renewed sense of purpose that hasn't been seen since the end of the Cold War. Okay, brief channel update to close out. Given that we're going into Easter here in Australia and many other places around the world, I thought an early release was the least I could do given the circumstances. Call it a payback for the late release a week or two ago. I'm aware that today's topic was a little bit of a deviation from the more technical topics I ordinarily tend to cover. But given we've covered Russian grand strategy and doctrine before, I thought it was worthwhile having a look at America to see what makes its security strategy tick. I acknowledge in doing so that all of this stuff, even the most basic elements of security theory, are going to be heavily debated. But hopefully you feel this video at the very least brought something valuable to that discussion. And so with one final reassurance that I don't actually intend to start an iron ore exporting cartel anytime soon, please allow me to wish you all the very best and to assure you that I'll see you again next week.